the good thing about these larger pods like this is you can get a lot more okri from one pod what's up lazy dog fam hope all y'all are having a spectacular day it is tuesday july 4th here in south georgia and on today's video we're going to harvest our first okri from these dwarf cow horn plants here behind me talk a little bit more about this variety answer some questions we've been getting about this variety then we're going to head on over to the back part of the property and i'm going to show you how fast some of these pumpkins are growing so in this 30 foot row here, we've got nine dwarf cow horn okri plants. We gave these a little more space than we traditionally do okri because these plants don't get very tall, but they do get kind of bushy and wide. And as you can see here, there's not much space between each plant. These things will continue to get more bushy and more bushy. So I noticed earlier today that we've got a few pods on here that we need to harvest. There's one right there. Now hopefully what I'm about to demonstrate here is going to echo what I told you when we put these oak tree transplants in the ground in this spot. And that is the reason I like this variety so much is you don't have to pick it as often as you do other oak tree varieties. So earlier today we got back from a little four day camping trip on the Gulf. And just as a side note, seems like no matter where I go on vacation, when I get back here, it's always hotter here than wherever I've been. Now, I know we don't live in the hottest place on earth, but if I go down to the beach during the summer, it's always a little cooler there than it is here. And if I go to the mountains in the fall, it's always cooler there than it is here. So when you get back home, you've always got that nice welcoming humidity to bring you back to reality. But anyways, my point is, even though I've been gone for four days, with this particular variety here, we're still going to have some good okra to eat tonight. Now there may be a few pods in here that have gotten a little too gargantuan on us. Maybe that one right there. Let me pick what we've got here in this row and I'll show you what I mean. All right, so not an absolute heap of okra here by any means. These plants are just getting started producing, but this is enough to do what I want to do with it tonight. Now we've got quite a few different pod sizes here as you can see and so what we'll do is kind of go through these and show you the point at which this particular variety the dwarf cow horn aka dwarf longhorn okri starts to get tough so we'll start off with this pod here which is about i don't know four inches long or so and the jambalaya variety that we used to grow a lot when we were selling our veggies it would tend to get tough when it got a little longer than this right here but this pod is going to be nice and tender and then we've got this pod here, which is a little longer than that first one. This one's probably five or six inches long, I can feel. It's still going to be nice and tender there. Some varieties will start to get tough at this length here. Some varieties you can let get a little longer. Then we've got this pod, which is about eight inches long or so. And this one is still nice and tender. The good thing about these larger pods like this is you can get a lot more okri from one pod than you can if you're just harvesting tiny little four inch pods so that one right there is going to put a lot of okri in the pot tonight and then we've got these two monsters here now i don't know if you can tell but this one here is about an inch inch and a half longer than this one now i can feel this one and tell you that it's too tough this one needs to go to the chickens or the worms not going to make it to the pot tonight this one here however i can feel of it and it still feels nice and tender so we will be able to eat this one right here now if i didn't need this one for my dish tonight i'd take a big bite out of this one and chew it up and prove to you that it is tender enough but you're just going to have to take my word for it now some of this okri tenderness does have to do with soil moisture if your soil is moist okri will tend to stay tender at longer lengths if your soil is really dry sometimes it'll get tougher faster but hopefully that kind of shows you where the limit is or the limit can be on this dwarf cowhorn okri variety you can let it get pretty dang long before it gets tough now if you live in a warmer climate and want to do another planting of okra, we do still have some of these dwarf cow horn seeds on our website at lazydogfarm.com. We've been getting a lot of messages over the last few days from people who planted these seeds and are just starting to harvest some of them. They thought the color on them was a little peculiar because they weren't dark green like most okra varieties. Yes, this is the color 
they're supposed to be they're kind of pale like you see here also with this particular variety you don't necessarily want to prune the plants like we do with a lot of other oak tree varieties just let these grow let them get really bushy because you'll get a lot of production from those side branches as they grow and per backyard garden rule number 41 like i've told you before i don't make these rules i just follow them but per that rule we've got to make oak tree and tomatoes over rice with our first oak tree harvest i think we've got enough oak tree now we just need to get us a couple of these nice heirloom tomatoes here now we don't have many of these heirloom plants left but i think we do have a couple good candidates for our oak tree and tomatoes tonight we only need a couple fruits might grab that big wisconsin tomato there that's an absolute beauty and i think i'll grab that turkey creek tomato right there as well and if you've never had okra and tomatoes over white rice first of all come on now but second of all you can get with the program go to our website lazydogfarm.com under the blog section we've got a recipes blog we've got a nice little easy to follow recipe for okra and tomatoes over white rice Go over there, check that out. If you've never made it, make it one time, and I promise you, you'll be hooked. And now over here on the back half of the property, let me show you what's going on with our attempts to grow some giant butternut squash and some giant pumpkins. Now what I'm about to explain here is some very beginner giant pumpkin growing advice if you're just kind of playing around like I'm doing, trying to grow a 200, 300, 400, maybe even 500 pound pumpkin. If you want to take a deep dive into the giant pumpkin growing thing, maybe compete for state records, you need to go check out my buddy Ryan over at the Heavenly Hills Homestead channel. He goes way more in detail than I will. So in this little 20 foot wide plot here, we've obviously got some weeds we need to take care of, but we've also got two very large pumpkin plants. That's right, there's only two plants in this plot, but these plants get absolutely massive. I think the second plant down here will provide a little better example of what we're trying to do as far as growth habit goes. So right here is where we put our transplant in the ground. That's what I'm calling our stump there. And you can see I fertilized these pretty good before I left town the other day. So there's our stump and running along that little wet spot there where we have a line of drip tape buried is our primary vine. So we've trained that to run along where our drip tape is. Now, if we get on the other side of that massive plant, what we can see here, and I knew this was gonna happen, is that we're running out of room, running out of garden space for our primary vine. We can see it's trying to grow all the way out here. So what I probably need to do is kind of point it back that way a little bit so it can grow along that bare soil there. And then from that primary vine, we get these secondary vines that we want to kind of grow out to the side like branches of a tree. Now what I've been doing is kind of pulling mine back this way a little bit because I knew I was going to run out of room at some point. So I've been tailing them back a little bit instead of having them grow perpendicular to the primary vine. So we want to train that primary vine, train these secondary vines a little bit, and then off those secondary vines, we'll get what they call some tertiary vines. And I'm told those are the ones you want to prune off. Now, I don't have any big tertiary vines to show you, but we can see some starting right down there. So at some point in the near future, I'll cut those off. That way we only have primaries and secondaries out here. So that's the vine training process in a nutshell. Now there are a lot of other nuances to it that the professional giant growers will talk about. But if you're just kind of playing around like we are, you should be able to grow a decent sized one just by doing what I showed you there. Now let's talk about the pumpkins themselves. So we'll go back to this first plant here where we have this rascal that is growing extremely fast. I'm not kidding you, four days ago when I left town, that was as big as a softball. Now it's bigger than a basketball. It's amazing how fast these things grow. Now Ryan always talks about hand pollinating. I've never done any hand pollination with these. I just let the bees do their thing and I always get a fruit. But I guess some of the professional guys do hand pollinate. That looks like a nice one there. That looks like a keeper. So we'll leave that one on the plant and any other fruits that develop will cut off. So for example, back down here with this second plant, we've got a nice one right there. That looks like a keeper. 
we'll cut that one there off because we want the plant to devote all its energy to that one right there and pretty soon i'll probably take some bricks piece of plywood and some foam insulation make me a nice little platform for that puppy to grow on now over here where we have these two giant butternut squash plants, we're basically trying to do the same exact thing, trying to employ the same strategy, but we're gonna run into some obstacles here because these Seminole pumpkins are trying to take over the world as they normally do. So we started out here training the vines just like I showed you with those giant pumpkins. Now it gets a little harder to see what's a primary, what's a secondary, and what's a tertiary because we've just got vines everywhere. Now on our first giant butternut plant, I had this baby right here, which I was really rooting for. This thing was growing by leaps and bounds every single day until we started getting all that bad weather a couple weeks ago. Kind of whipped the vines around pretty bad, broke the stem a little bit, didn't break it completely, but it cracked it a little bit. Also got some hail damage right there and the growth has slowed significantly on this one. I don't think it's able to get all the juice it needs to get. So I think I'm gonna call it quits on this one today. And we've got enough plant left out here and some more fruits developing. I'm gonna see if we can grow an even bigger one off this same plant. We're gonna go ahead and get this one, weigh it, see what we've got. Now, I don't really know the best way to do this, but we're going to try to use our bathroom scale here in a dog's bucket. We'll see how it works. Get our scale clicked on there. Get our bucket there. We'll sit this inside the bucket. Hopefully that gives us a somewhat accurate measurement. Wait a second. And 22.4 pounds. So nowhere near the record potential that these seeds have, but not bad for our first try at giant butternut squash. And especially considering all the bad weather that this one here had to deal with a few weeks ago. In case you're wondering, yes, we can eat this. Yes, we will eat this. Not going to eat it right now. We'll put it underneath the barn, let it cure for a little bit. But we will eventually eat it. Might even make some baby food with it. I think little baby Essie would enjoy some of this giant butternut squash. And we've already been getting some submissions from some of you playing along with our giant butternut squash growing contest to win a big jug of AgriThrive fertilizer. So if you purchase some of these seeds from us and you're growing some of these plants here, you can send us a message on Facebook or Instagram with a picture of your giant butternut on a scale or you can send us an email to support at lazydogfarm.com. And so hopefully with what I've got left out here, I can try to grow one larger than that one. It's gonna to be tough to train the vines with our Seminole pumpkins kind of mingling here, but we'll do the best we can. I've got a nice looking fruit here, nice potential candidate off that plant where we just harvested that 22 pounder. I need to remove those little fruits there, try to devote all the energy to that one. We'll see what happens there. And then on our second plant over here, I don't trip all over these vines. That one there looks pretty promising. That one right there looks pretty promising too. I need to pick one of those to go with on the second plant. And even if you don't care anything about growing a giant, maybe you just want to grow a bunch of food. I know some people that bought these seeds are just doing that. You can leave all the fruits out there. They'll all still get really big. You won't grow a giant, but you'll have a lot of groceries off one plant. So I hope you enjoyed the video today. Don't forget to check out our affiliate links and coupon codes in the description below. And also go check out our website, lazydogfarm.com, where you can find those okra seeds and that recipe I talked about. And if you like growing pumpkins, check out this video right here. This is our polar bear harvest from this past fall. Polar bear is a great variety for us to grow in the fall. We got some giant pumpkins from this harvest right here. So check that out and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm.